perfect. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Do It Movement podcast. This is your host, Martine Jackson, and I've built my six-figure, soon-to-be seven-figure, massive real estate business through commercial investing, rental investing, and wholesaling in Virginia. After college, I worked a series of jobs that I absolutely hated and decided to take life into my own hands. What my journey has shown me is one very important thing. Knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is power. Each week, I bring you a powerful guest or tip to unravel the real estate game. And my challenge to you is that you take some of that knowledge and do something with it. The Do It Movement is here to help you create the life you desire through real estate. Now let's get to it. Hello today, Do It Movement listeners. This is your host, Martine Jackson. Today we have a very special guest. We have the one, the only, Mary Hart. Hey, Mary. Hey, Martine. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad that you're on. You're a wealth of knowledge. We're going to learn well, so much today. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for having me. How many days do you have for this podcast? I got lots to tell. <laughs> We can do part one and part two <laughs> if we don't make it through everything. But um, for, the okay. folks, for the folks that don't know who you are, uh, just tell people like um, what are, what's your background and how'd you get into real estate. And you're an, also an attorney, so you can share that as well. Sure, yeah. So I um, have been an attorney for about, gosh, I don't know, 28, 29 years, although I'm technically retired from attorneying and just consulting now, uh, very rarely. I'm actually now a farmer in Kentucky, which I'm loving. My husband and I are are living on our farm and enjoying that. Um, But my background is so many, many years as an attorney, and I started out as an estate planning attorney and then added on real estate and business and all these things that have a lot of synergy with each other. And I had my own law firm in Asheville for a long time, and I shut that down a couple of years ago and was being solo practice attorney, but now I've kind of stopped that as well. Um, I'm also a 1031 qualified intermediary, and I am a licensed realtor, although I don't uh, do real estate anymore Mm -hmm. um, for anybody else. I just do it for myself. And what else? That's about it. Mom of three boys, uh, stepmother of three more children, and... (laughs) Mother of a few goats and horses and dogs and all that. So you do everything. We got it. <laughs> I do a lot. Yes, I do a lot. For sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm really glad to have you on the podcast because I'm pretty sure you're going to point out a lot of things that a lot of us investors can do better because you know the law way better than we do. So let, let's dive into that. What are some okay. things, like some common mistakes that you see a lot of people make? Sure. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say is that, you know, I, I, I changed the name of this topic from legal mistakes to best practices. So I was trying okay. to make it a little less negative, but it still comes across like all the mistakes people make. And this is just sort of a list I've compiled over the last 28 years, of things that I could think of that people had done wrong. But I think one of the issues is people don't use the law proactively. If, if I had an umbrella mm-hmm. mistake, it would be the people don't use the law proactively. They, they react, which always causes more headache, time, expense, bad results. Uh, so I always say that the law has two parts. You've got the sword and you've got the shield. And if you Mm -hmm. use the field of the law proactively to protect yourself and minimize or avoid mistakes or minimize the consequences, you're always going to be a thousand percent better off than if you wait and use the sword of the law to react when something bad happens. So mistake number Mm -hmm. one is not being proactive. And I think a lot of times people don't do that. Um, or don't do it well for a couple of reasons. One, as John Heyer would say, real estate investors are cheap, cheap, cheap. You know, like, <laughs> and that's true. Nobody wants to pay a lawyer, right, to set right. things up. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is people sometimes talk to the wrong people. They'll be at a cocktail party or networking event, and someone will give a, tell a story or talk about how to do something, but they don't realize that one little change in facts can really change what you need to do or don't do or how things are set up. So I think that, uh, you know, seek professional advice and and I'm not trying to sell my services because I'm not practicing law anymore, but I think it's the best dollars you can spend is to 
make sure things are set up correctly the first in the first place. So that's sort of my big overall uh, rule. And I guess the second rule would be have have a plan at all. You know, a lot of people, and I guess that's part of the same thing. They they wait for things to happen, and they think, well, let's take life and death planning or estate planning, for instance. They mm -hmm. assume the law will take care of everything, and it just it doesn't. So that's sort of the overall rubric. And I don't know if you want to ask me questions or if you want me to just start throwing out a bunch of things, but you, you let me know how you want to do well, this. Well, yeah. Well, I can ask you a couple of questions and just, I guess, give people my point of view because I know, like, I don't know if I'm like most investors, but I know me, I'm just a jump in type of person. I didn't even think about looking at the law before doing certain things. So um, I guess we could talk about, you, you're saying that a lot of people need to be proactive, but what are some things that you think that um, they should look more into? I know like having your, um, you know, your documents together, but sure. what are some things that you think people Let's can do better? Yeah, there are a number of different topics. And let's just, I'll, I'll start the first one on my list because it really applies to everyone, not just real estate investors. So this applies mm -hmm. to everyone over the age of 18. And it has to do with what is legally called estate planning, estate planning. I call it mm -hmm. life and death planning. And the mm -hmm. first mistake would be people just don't have a plan. You know, they assume if they're married and they die that everything will go to their spouse. They assume that if they become disabled, their spouse will automatically have the right to make decisions for them or that things will automatically pass to their children. And it just doesn't always work that way. So I'd say, you know, in estate planning, have a plan, put the right documents in place. Uh, people don't want to think about dying or becoming disabled, right? It's never going right. to happen. Before. I'm young. It'll happen many years from now. So, you know, right. I don't have to worry about it, right? Um, but I would say tomorrow may not come. I mean, you don't know where, whether you're going to get hit by a bus when you walk out of the house or whether you're going to get brain cancer. And you know, these are horrible, morbid things, but we just don't know. People don't right. always live to a ripe old age or they don't, you know, they aren't perfectly healthy until the day they just drop dead. So we need to plan for what happens if you become disabled or you die. So have a plan and we can, if you want to go back later and talk about exactly what that looks like, but you know, make sure you know what you're doing because I've seen people who've, uh, even put a will together, but they've inadvertently disqualified their children from government benefits or disability benefits, or they've, you know, conflicted out a second spouse with their children or something like that. So there are a lot of different things you can do to make, make your estate plan better. Um, another topic is planning with a self-directed IRA. People do this wrong all the time. And the tax consequences are potentially huge, huge mm -hmm. with this. So if you're going to self-direct your IRA and use that for investing, you can make tons of money and it can be a great investment vehicle. But do it right. Know your disqualified parties. Know what the prohibited transaction rules are. Know how to title your investment. I see this wrong all the time. For instance, if I have my IRA and I want to buy a piece of real property, my deed is not going to read the Mary Hart IRA, right? right. It's going to read, let's, let's say, in case my friend Quincy's listening, and uh, <laughs> trust, trust company, it might say, you know, Quest Trust Company as custodian for the benefit of Mary Hart IRA number, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's right. the custodian and you, that's actually the title holder for your account. It's not you personally. So make sure you title it right. Make right. sure you have beneficiaries, named beneficiaries. And make sure you have an alternate. So many people name their first beneficiary because they always assume that they'll die first and their beneficiary will be around. But that beneficiary may die before them. Um, right. Make sure that beneficiaries are, are designated correctly. And these are some, some legal concepts. We can get into the details later. But, you know, naming your beneficiaries and an alternate is important. Title your IRA uh, investments correctly. Know your prohibited transaction rules. And, and it's weird with the prohibited transaction rules, some things can trip people up that they'd never think about. For instance, right. you cannot provide credit to your IRA or vice versa. So don't get a credit card associated with your IRA bank account. If, mm -hmm. if, they, if the bank issues you a credit card in your own name, you just engaged in a prohibited transaction. Nobody thinks right. of that stuff, right? right. So look at those things. Um, let me just scroll through. Business entities. You know, there are a lot of different types of entities. Make sure mm -hmm. you're making the proper choices for the type of entity you set up, plus the proper type of tax election. Those are sometimes different things. Uh, make sure that you have the proper documentation. You don't commingle your 
personal and your business checking accounts, for instance, or your personal and business expenses. Um, mm -hmm. If you have partners, have a, a, an operating agreement for your LLCs or buy sell agreement that says what happens if somebody dies. I know we're going fast, so we can slow it down, but I'm just trying to throw out some. You, you give it all to us. <laughs> well, that's not even remotely all of it, but um, you, know, you mentioned the documentation earlier. And let's take private lending, which I do a lot of private lending. Uh, documentation is either a borrower or a lender can save your bacon. You know, if you don't, if you don't have your documentation right and something goes wrong, regardless of which party you are, you could end up in a bad situation because the documents mm -hmm. weren't drafted legally and with the right um, clauses or paragraphs in them. And so when I go into a loan, for instance, not only do I make sure I do due diligence, but I'm going to make sure that the documents are correct. If I think I have a first lien position, I better make sure that deed of trust or mortgage is proper and recorded, or I don't really have a first lien position. Right? All right. Um, do I want a personal guarantee on my note or not, you know, as a lender? Um, right. So things like that, have your paperwork correct and, and do your due diligence. If you're going to use land trusts, um, have the right beneficiary. So we could go into more detail of any of these things, but. Yeah, I have a, actually have a question for you because I asked uh, my attorney yesterday at a closing. For, yeah. if, I, if you're closing in a land trust, um, let's say the beneficiary is your company, your LLC or whatever, mm -hmm. who should you elect as a trustee? This is like, this is, how, this is yeah. the, the struggle I have. I, know, I don't know who to elect as the trustee. <laughs> well, there are a couple things. So first of all, I'm always, tickled by the, the name trustee because it should be somebody you trust, right? Right. So that's number one. You should name somebody you trust to be your trustee. And we, we put things in a trust because we don't trust people, right? Right. <laughs> so we have to have somebody we trust to be the trustee. So it's an interesting word. But uh, a couple things specifically with land trust, one of the main reasons people use them is to remain anonymous, right? They're not, mm -hmm. a, they're not a, a creditor protected entity per se, but they're, they create a smoke screen and they, you want to be anonymous behind this land trust. So if you name yourself the trustee and your name is on the deed as the trustee, how anonymous are you? So the second Not rule, much. don't name yourself, right? right? Don't name someone with your same last name. So mm -hmm. your spouse or a sibling or somebody who has the same last name, because if they're looking for somebody, you know, you have a pretty common last name, Jackson. Um, right. But let's say heart. If they, somebody's looking for me, how many hearts are there out there? Or you know, Zimpernowskinskis, how many are there? Whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> Pick somebody that, that if they're searching, searching under your name, they're not going to find your investment necessarily. Um, you know, I usually do it as a, say, a financial friend. We talk about mm -hmm. that, our financial friends network. So I will try to find a fellow real estate investor that I trust, that um, I believe will do the right thing, that will understand the land trust and their duties as a trustee. So mm -hmm. if, if the trust does get pulled into a lawsuit and the trust document says the trustee is prohibited from giving anyone a copy of that trust, that my trustee knows that and understands the reasons for that and doesn't willy nilly hand a copy of the trust to the other attorney when they say, hey, give me a copy of the trust, right? You gotta have right. someone that, that is either trainable or already knows what the whole purpose of a land trust is and can really uphold the purposes of your land trust. So there's no black or white answer in terms of a right person or a wrong person specifically, but just the characteristics that you want is someone that you know well, that you trust, that understands the document and the purpose behind it and has the strength and integrity to uphold your land trust and the, and the, you know, the, the clauses within it if they get called to the carpet on it or get pulled into a lawsuit. Right, right, right. That I have a, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. I have, I know my questions are probably going to be kind of scattered because I'm kind of scattered. That's all right. right? I like scattered. <laughs> but you mentioned about the estate planning before and um, it, you're right. A lot of people don't like to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about dying. How do you get some, like people you care about and you know, you love and you want them to do some estate planning, but they're just totally against it. How do you yeah. get them? Good to question. <laughs> I see it all the time. First of all, be a good role model, have your own estate plan in place. Right. And everybody over 18 should have estate planning documents because once you're 18, nobody else can make a decision for you. So if you become 
disabled, someone may have to go to court to get the authority to even sign a check for you. So have, say, powers of attorney in place or whatever. We won't go into the details right now, but be a good role model. Do it yourself. All my sons got estate plans for their 18th birthday, by the way. So they they <laughs> might they not have it. liked it. They got some cash and some other stuff, but they got an estate plan. Luckily, their mom. Right. Um, so number one, be a good role model. Number two, you know, a lot of people don't want to do an estate plan because it feels like they're facing their mortality. Mm -hmm. so I'll tell people a couple of things to try to bring them to the table. Number one, Murphy's Law says if you do it, nothing will ever happen to you, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the shield of protection. Mm -hmm. right? But really, the, the idea is that if you do an estate plan, then guess who's in control? You are. If you don't do your estate plan where you make choices about what happens and who manages your things and who inherits, if, if you don't do it, then other people are in control, like the state legislature or the judge or family members that you might not even like. You know, mm -hmm. so, so the biggest thing for me is you tell people, do it. And it gives you control. And probably the biggest thing I like to say, and this is copyrighted, by the way, it is your ultimate love letter to your family, your friends, your charities, whomever you are benefiting by your estate plan. Doing your estate plan is the ultimate love letter to your loved ones. Because when somebody dies and, you know, somebody you love dies or becomes disabled, don't you want to just be able to focus on the grief and the, the ability to, to take care of them physically or be with them or whatever if they're still alive and not have mm -hmm. to focus on the, the details of trying to get things done when there's no roadmap and there's no authority, mm -hmm. right? So put the plan in place so your loved ones have a roadmap and have the authority to travel down the right path so that they can just go about the business of loving you and grieving and or taking care of you and nurturing you. Mm -hmm. So that's how I try to convince people. How, I guess, how often would you suggest people to update their estate plans? Like, let's say you start when you, you're 18 and, you know, your life's changing, especially like your 20s yeah. is changing a lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, but how often do you suggest people can, like, go back and update stuff? Sure. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, when we draft estate planning documents, we, we are not really usually putting certain assets in there. We're not saying, well, my you know, Volkswagen Beetle goes to Jane and my house at 123 Main Street goes to Bob, although we, we right. can do that. But a lot of times it's more general. Whatever I happen to own at the time of death goes here or whatever. Okay. Um, so we try to set up the documents as flexibly as possible so we don't have to change the documents every time we have a change in circumstance, number one. Number two, you should always review it any time a big change happens in your life. You get married, you have kids, one of your beneficiaries dies, you go from a pauper to a multimillionaire because you win the lottery. You know, so anytime a big thing happens, you should review it. Beyond that, you know, usually every couple of years, just I tell people, make a date with yourself one day a year, whether it's your birthday, New Year's Eve, Christmas, excuse me, I got a fly in my room here. <laughs> um, you know, whatever it is that whatever you want, what date you want to pick. And every mm -hmm. year, just sort of pull out your estate planning documents and Take a look and say, is this still what I want it to be? Oh, there are two flies. Still what I want it to be, not what I want it to be, um, and just review it. We had a wedding here this weekend, and I can tell the door was left open a lot. Because right. <laughs> one of them, and there are flies in here now. Right. Anyway, so I apologize for seeing me swatting. Um, but so, you know, otherwise, if you don't have big circumstances, look at it every year, every couple years. Just skim through your documents and go, would I change that? Because a lot of times what I realize is, like say an IRA beneficiary. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people name their beneficiary when they open their account and they never look at it again for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And maybe they've gotten divorced and their spouse is still a beneficiary or they've named their best friend as their executor in their will and they hate that person now or whatever it is. You know, right. just, just take a look periodically. Right, right, right. That makes sense? That makes sense. So oh, how would you suggest someone find someone to do... Uh, like any documents that you need for your business or estate planning, like should we just Google <laughs> or? Well, that's always a good, good question. Um, you know, ask people that you know and trust who they've used, if they've used somebody for, for an estate plan that's not real estate investor specific, you know, it's any good estate planning lawyers. And there is a uh, service called Martindale Hubble. First word is Martindale, M-A-R-T-I-N-D-A-L-E. Mm -hmm. Dash Hubble, H-U-B-B-E-L-L, -L, I believe. And they have a lawyer rating system that's done by the lawyer's peers. So people get nominated and they get rated by their peers. And so 
that's a good place to start. I think they may have a website called lawyers.com now or something, and they, they have a rating system. So you want to look at someone who spends a lot of time in the area of practice in which you need work done, that they have a good rating or they have good peer reviews. They don't have bad reviews on Google or anything else. And then ask people that you trust. And frankly, you know, go in and ask if you can have a 15 minute sort of interview. Make sure they don't have three heads and that they can actually answer your questions without, you know, preparing for 14 hours before they answer your question. Right. Like you're talking about having scattered questions. I don't mind scattered questions. I love them when I'm teaching because then you ask me something I'm not prepared ahead of time, people can tell whether I know my stuff. Right. <laughs> if, if every question somebody's going to ask me, I have to know ahead of time, then obviously I've got to go research and I might not really know my stuff very well. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. I know that this topic that you're talking about is something that I definitely need to get better at. I'm just becoming organized myself <laughs> to yeah. put yeah. stuff well, into hard. place. It's hard for people to do. It's easy to procrastinate. I mean, I'm not perfect. I still have little things that I need to do that have changed. And, oh, I've got to go change that. The member on that operating agreement because now I have such and such, and, you know. I don't get around to it as quickly as I should either. So, right. So I guess the main point to take away, it seems like is to be proactive and I know I've been rather reactive, so yeah, got to get better are. at that. But, um, so let's say you have all your documents in place for your business. Um, you know, you got your estate planning done. Uh, you actually read the rules for IRA instead of just doing it. <laughs> um, what are some other things or are there any other things that we should be, you know, looking into that we, maybe we're not even thinking about looking into? Well, let me think about that, but I want to go back for a minute because you said yeah, something that reminded me, you know, we just talked about the estate planning lawyer, but let's say you want to land, you want to do a land trust or you mm -hmm. want somebody who deals with self-directed IRAs. Right. I won't say most lawyers, but I'll say most lawyers don't know what they're talking about with that. I didn't either until I specifically started learning it. So if someone says, I want a self-directed IRA owned LLC, any business lawyer who does an LLC may think, oh, I, I do LLCs all the time. We'll just make the IRA the member. Right. No big, but they don't realize that there's a specific type of operating agreement that needs to be in place for a self-directed IRA owned LLC. Certain clauses need to be left out. Certain clauses need to be put in. And so unless somebody specifically knows self-directed IRA law, they're not going to know that. Same thing about land trust. You know, I did a, I did a loan once with a, a borrower who was borrowing in a land trust uh, because they were going to buy the, the property in a land trust. And I said, well, let me look at your trust. So don't worry about it. I had my real estate lawyer review it and, and he made a bunch of changes. I said, no, I'm not loaning to a trust that I don't know is a good right. trust. So they sent me the trust and it was completely wrong. The lawyer who was a great real estate lawyer knew nothing about land trust. He wasn't a real estate investor type lawyer right. and he totally screwed up that trust. He made it irrevocable, meaning the guy could never change it. He made the beneficiary wrong. Everything was wrong. Well, if I hadn't looked at it, this poor real estate investor would have no idea the, the trouble he was getting himself into. So when you're doing a land trust or personal property trust or anything that's sort of real estate specific, Find a lawyer who can do real estate investor work because it's not the same as regular real estate in, in many cases. Right, right. So you need more of like a, I don't know if creative attorney is the name, but you need somebody that knows more of the specifics of the different types of vehicles right. you can use. Right. Someone who knows what a land trust is and what needs to be in there and how they work. You know, a regular old trust attorney, and I was one of them for many, many years. I said, well, land trusts aren't valid in our mm -hmm. state. Well, that's crazy. A trust is just a contract. It's valid in every state, but you may have to put certain clauses in it to make it meet state law for your state. So you've got to find someone who understands not just trust law, but land trust law. And I'll be honest, that is hard to find. That's hard to find. But so, they're, they're out there. They're out there. So you bring up a point um, that I, so I went to this retreat this weekend, actually. It was actually another mastermind. But um, we were talking about putting things in trust, and I know I've learned about putting things in land trust, but I haven't really learned about putting them in just a regular trust. What are the differences, if I were to say I want to put it in a trust rather than a land trust, is there any big difference in that? Well, it's interesting because 
when you say trust, there are so many different types of trust for so many purposes. Right. There are the, the broad categories or there are irrevocable trusts and there are revocable trusts. Can you change right. it? Can you not change it. There are trusts where you're the beneficiary and trusts where you're not. There are trusts mm-hmm. where you're a trustee and trusts where you're not. So you have to figure out what, what it is you're trying to accomplish with that trust and find the lawyer who can put you in the right type of trust. They're all normal trusts. Mm-hmm. You know, a land trust is a normal trust. A living trust for estate planning purposes is a normal trust. A charitable remainder trust for charity purposes is a normal trust for the purpose for which it's intended. So you have to know what your purpose is and find a lawyer who can put you in the right trust. But what I think you're asking is what's the difference, this is a common question, between say a land trust and a revocable living trust for estate planning purposes. Does that sound like maybe that was what you were heading towards? Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) I just knew it was called a trust. I don't know what type of trust it is. Uh, Many, many, many types of trusts for many, (laughs) many purposes. But I'll give you some general rules. Um, If you want a trust to be completely creditor protected, the Mm -hmm. first thing it has to be is irrevocable. And you can't change it. You can't revoke it. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. In most states, you also cannot be a beneficiary of that trust. There are some states where there's a a slight possibility, not slight, there is a a way to be a beneficiary, but you have to follow certain rules. Mm -hmm. But so creditor protected trusts, by definition, are generally irrevocable and you are not the beneficiary, with Mm -hmm. with some exceptions. If uh, if you're doing a, a revocable trust, let's say you're doing it just for your estate planning, it's just like your will, it's like a substitute for your will. You want to be able to change that as circumstances change. So that needs to be a revocable trust. You can revoke it. You can change it. You can take assets out of it. You can put assets into it, right? If it's a land trust, one of the main hallmarks is you want to be anonymous and you don't want people to know who the beneficiary of that trust is. So you have to have clauses in that trust that prohibit the uh, disclosure of the terms of the trust, right? And who the beneficiary is. So a land trust has very specific types of clauses. And there's some more complex pieces to it that I'm not going to go into right now because we could teach a whole course on that alone. Um, But the the general thing is to to identify first what is your goal and what is your purpose. And then you find the right advisor to work with and they can help you narrow down, well, what trust is appropriate to meet that goal? Right. Is your goal charitable planning and tax avoidance? Is your goal anonymity for creditors is your goal absolute creditor protection is your goal to benefit you know the charity of your choice is your goal to keep things in trust for your children so they don't manage it at age 18 you know you got to figure out what your goal is first and then a good advisor will design the right plan for you and i hate to say that but this is not a do-it-yourself area of the law and i would say that even with land trust no matter how many conferences you can go to and how great they are and you can get some really good information but someone should at least look over that trust who knows what they're doing and give mm-hmm. you some advice. Okay. Okay. That's so fine. if we want to get an advisor and we don't want to show up completely clueless, um, are there any books you recommend or like anything that we can watch that's online to help us become more familiar with some sure. of Sure. Well, you know, Walter Wofford, he has lots of videos on trusts and self-directed IRAs and all that. So he has a lot. Um, There are various real estate investor books out there that will tell you certain things. Um, If you want detailed information for your situation, uh, in some cases I can be talked into doing a consulting package, but it's, Mm -hmm. I don't do it by the hour anymore because I'm trying to design my life, have an intentional life. Right. (laughs) I do it where, you know, it's like a two day deal where we go through everything from A to Z on your plan and make recommendations and give you a to-do list that then you take to your attorney to implement, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I would say if someone has a, you know, really wants that kind of help, that level of detail, then you could call me and we could schedule something, but that's, you know, minimum $5,000 fee. Mm -hmm. You get two days worth of lawyer time, which is worth a lot more than that. If I charge Mm -hmm. by the hour, my hourly rate was $400 an hour. (laughs) But anyway, uh, so there are books, you can find books that are and videos that are good general information, but your specific situation, you're going to have to have someone to go through it with you. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Well, um, do you have anything else that, you know, we may have missed that you kind of want to touch on a little more? Well, yeah, a a couple of things. Um, I mean, this, we could go on for, you know, 10 hours on this stuff. But one of the things that I, 
<laughs> One of the things that I see happen a lot is people get into joint ventures or partnerships or LLCs with other people and they don't document things well. They don't go into these joint ventures or business relationships with an exit strategy in mind. And so things are not set up properly. And when something goes wrong or somebody wants out, it, it falls apart because there's been no plan put in place to figure out what to do. Right. Yeah. So, and there are lots of little details about like, let's say you're in a, in a joint venture agreement and you don't want it to be treated as a partnership under the law. Well, you mm -hmm. need to say that in your documents. This is not a partnership because mm -hmm. for instance, if you and I were doing a deal together, Martine as a joint venture, but it got treated as a partnership, uh, I could be liable for everything you do and you could be liable for everything I do, whether you know I've done it or not. Right. right. And so a partnership, people think, well, we're not in a partnership because we don't have a partnership agreement. Mm -hmm. That's not the law. The law is a partnership is defined as two people coming together to do something for profit. Mm -hmm. Right. So we might want a joint venture equity split on a deal or whatever, mm -hmm. but in the law, that might look like a general partnership. And if, if I go out and run up a half a million dollars worth of debt in the name of our joint venture partnership, you could be held liable for that. Wow. So you want to make sure that your joint venture agreement spells out exactly what each, uh, I won't say partner, but each joint venturer can do and not do and specifically state it's not a partnership, things like that. You know what I mean? Right. right. Um, if you're trying to do asset protection, start early because once you know there's a claim potentially coming down the pike, your asset protection can't be started then because mm -hmm. it'll all be set aside by a court if you haven't already put it in place for legitimate other reasons, planning reasons. In other words, right. you can't do something to defraud creditors if you know it might come down the pike, right? right. Um, Another topic I do a lot, I'm sitting here in my vacation rental house, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of laws about vacation rentals and vacation rentals can bring you a lot of money, but you need to make sure they're legal where mm -hmm. you're doing it. Uh, you need to make sure that you have the right insurance that covers vacation rentals, it's not just mm -hmm. your regular homeowner's insurance. Mm -hmm. um, realize that they can change the law on you at any time. And so mm -hmm. if you're, all your numbers are only based on the income from a vacation rental, and they take that away, do you have another exit strategy? Does it also work as a long-term rental? Can you sell it? You know, right. those types of things. So let me just flip through yeah, my... Yeah, I have a question about like a uh, JV agreement. So yeah. I know like me, I'm just going to talk for myself. I'm not going to talk for anyone else. So for myself yeah. personally, I always like to think of best case scenario. And I know that you need to plan for if things don't work out, if, um, you know, if you know, you need to take another exit strategy and things like that. But um, I guess for those JV agreements, I know you say you need to outline that, you know, this is not a partnership, but are there any clauses that come to mind that you need to be sure you have those in there just in case things go sour and you want to make sure that you can, you know, it, you could just go if you needed to. <laughs> Well, I think that's the, that's the key and it all has to be negotiated ahead of time and put in the paperwork is, you know, what if someone wants out or what if the uh, two people have a disagreement? Number one, in any business relationship, joint venture, partnership or LLC, please don't just be a 50-50 deal mm -hmm. because unless you've given someone more voting power, what happens if, you, if you're deadlocked? Two people who can't agree and they each have a 50-50 vote, you can't even get out of the partnership necessarily, unless you've got some deadlock breaking mechanism and uh, clause in your documents. Right. right. So a big mistake I see is people who just go and well, we'll just do 50, 50. Uh, okay. We've been in litigation for years, just trying to figure out who has more voting power because mm -hmm. we can't even choose a lawyer in a 50, 50 business if mm -hmm. each person disagrees on their lawyer. Right. right. So, um, so don't be 50, 50, anything you can think of have a clause in that agreement. And a big one is what if somebody wants to leave or someone goes bankrupt or someone embezzles or, you know, pick right. your trigger events. The, the big ones are somebody dies, somebody comes to say, becomes disabled and can no longer do the, the job for which they were brought into the joint venture. Uh, they become divorced and now all of a sudden half of your entity is a, uh, in the divorce court, mm -hmm. you know, um, somebody goes into bankruptcy and now all of a sudden the bankruptcy trustee is your business partner. You know, what are the trigger events that would fundamentally change the nature of what you're trying to do? And you know, the, the 
other party you're going into business with. But what happens if someone steps into their shoes? Oops, mm. you don't want to be a partner with someone's 17 year old kid or 18 year old right. kid or with their spouse that you don't like or with the bankruptcy judge or whatever. Right. Bankruptcy trustee. So figure out your trigger events. And what, how do you get out of it? If something happens, somebody dies, does the remaining, we'll call it partner for you know the, this purpose, does the remaining partner have the right to buy out the other person? Are they required to buy out the other person? Mm. Is nothing in place and the, the person who died, it just goes to his or her heirs or beneficiaries? You know, figure out what you want. So I think the exit strategy, how you end, how you wind up a partnership, when is this partnership or joint venture over? You know, when is it, uh, when can one person get out? What happens if one of those trigger events happen? Those are probably some of the most important ones. And, oops, sorry, it's my phone. and what happens if, um, if, if it all goes south, what happens? You know, who, who has the voting power? Who can shut it down? And if you are 50, 50, um, what's your deadlock breaking mechanism? Right. Third right. party. Do you each pick a third party who picks a third party? You know, that's a good point that you make because you bring up stuff that I probably wouldn't even have thought about. <laughs> that's, that's what a good lawyer will do is yeah. say, well, have you thought about this? And what about this? Because, you know, frankly, when I've been doing this for 28, 29 years, I've seen a lot of horror stories. I call them war stories. Mm -hmm. And every time there's a new war story, it makes me remember or think to talk to the person about what happens if this happens. Right. 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 That's why the plan a good plan is the ultimate love letter because there are a million things that you can't think of that you're leaving behind for your loved ones or, or even for yourself, you mm -hmm. know, that all of a sudden you're wrapped up in a litigation that takes all your time and energy and focus away from building your business because you didn't think to put your documents together properly or you went on, oh, I know this person, I'm just going to do a handshake deal. Don't ever do that. I wouldn't do that with my best friend. I wouldn't do that with my you know, children. I would have it in writing. Mm -hmm. And I'll say one more point about that, whether it's going into a business relationship, a, a, a lender borrower situation, a marriage for that sake. If, if you figure everything out and you negotiate all the terms of everything, when you're both on equal footing, it's going to be a lot more fair to each party when things break up, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't know going into something, who's going to be the person who wants to leave or who's going to be the person that was a bad actor. Mm, right? right. And so you don't know if you're going to be the lever or the levy in a business relationship when you're negotiating from equal footing, you know, all things being equal between the two parties, you're just going to have a more fair agreement for both parties in the end. Right. So what's the, I guess the worst story that you remember from bad planning, we have to put things in people's yeah. heads so they can say, Oh, I got to go do it. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's so many war stories. Um, a lot of them have to do with not understanding how things pass at death and having assets go to un unintended beneficiaries, right. you know, or having things un unintended happen. I'll give you a couple of easy examples. Um, you know, one was, and I've told these in some of my conferences, you may have heard it, but one was um, a husband and wife married in their 30s, but it was the wife's second marriage. She had kids for a prior marriage, maybe then they're late thirties or early forties by now. Mm -hmm. When they got married, she already owned a house. He moved into her house, but they never changed the deed to add his name to the deed. And she never did an estate plan, never did a will. So she died suddenly and unexpectedly in an accident. Mm -hmm. She had three small children. She had a husband who now had no interest in the house. He couldn't afford to keep the house. So he wanted to sell the house. He came in to me, I was, I was a young attorney at the time, and I said, you, you don't have any authority to do anything with this house. Mm -hmm. The law said he owned, now I think at the time, this was many years ago, half of it because he was an intestate heir, someone who inherits when you don't have a will. Mm -hmm. So he had inherited half of it, but the other half were owned by her three minor children whose guardian was the ex-husband that couldn't stand the current husband and vice versa. <laughs> so in order for anything to happen, this ex-husband and the current husband had to agree on everything. How horrible would that be? Wow. Right? That's a bad story. Another story was a, a real estate investor named Marsha Cole. She tells this story all the time. She's very vocal about it. She and her husband were very sophisticated, very successful real estate investors, very busy developments, you know, all this stuff. He died. Uh, he had an aneurysm or heart attack or something driving down the highway. Luckily, didn't take anybody else out, but he died suddenly in his 50s. Mm -hmm. She's in the middle of all these projects, and he had never done a will. So by law, she owned a part of his estate, and his unsophisticated parents owned 
the other part who they didn't have any real estate investment experience. Well, when all the banks that they had lines of credit and loans realized what had happened, they started pulling, you know, calling in all the lines of credit and the loans. And so here was Marcia. She couldn't even sell a painting on the wall without the consent of the deceased husband's parents who knew nothing about anything. So she almost lost every piece of property. Almost everything got foreclosed. It didn't because she had a white knight in shining armor, another real estate investor who came in and bought all these properties from her, but they bought them at cents on the dollar just to keep her from going into foreclosure. Right. Right. Lost almost everything. It took eight years, I think, to settle his estate, three different attorneys, blah, 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 all because he didn't even write on a kitchen cocktail napkin you know, I leave everything to my wife. This yeah. is my last will and testament. And that's, you know, it was so simple of a problem, but he didn't know it was a problem. So if you don't have anything in writing and you're married and like your parents are still living and you have kids and stuff, everyone has to share. It doesn't go directly to so, your house. Well, so here's what happens. First of all, it depends. It, de- it depends on the state law and the state in which you live at death. Right. Mm-hmm. Every state will have what's called the laws of intestacy. If you die without a will, who gets it and in what percentages, right? And it varies from state to state. Um, It does not automatically go to your spouse or your kids or your parents. It depends on the state law. But let me back up even further because this is where most people have an issue. What you first have to identify is how the asset, any particular asset, how is it titled will dictate how it passes at death. For instance, let's say, you know, my husband, Frank, if we own a house together as joint tenants with the right of survivorship and I die, it it passes to him automatically the moment I take my last breath because we owned it as joint tenants with a right of survivorship. He survived me. He had the right to the house. Right. Let's say the house was just in my name and I die. That's an asset that should pass through my will because it was just in my name. I did not have a joint owner. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a will then they'd have to look to the laws of the state in which I lived at the time of my death to determine who gets it. And usually it is some combination of a spouse, children, you know, it depends on who you're survived by. Is it a first marriage, a second marriage? Do you have parents? Do you not have parents? All depends on the state law. So <clears throat> it won't go to stepchildren. It won't go to a charity, for instance. Mm-hmm. So first thing, determine, make a, let's always tell a homework in my first boot camps. <laughs> make a list of every asset you own. Mm-hmm roughly its fair market value, and how it's titled. If it's anything that's just in your separate name, there's no joint owner with the right of survivorship, there's no trust, it's not in a trust, doesn't have a pay on death beneficiary, anything just in your name is gonna go through your will. Same thing with your interest in the tenants in common property. Like if you and I own a house together, 50-50 as tenants in common, Mm -hmm. not joint tenants with the right of survivorship, but tenants in common, your half will go through your will if you have one or by the laws of intestacy. If you don't, my half will go through my will or by the laws of intestacy. So first determine how everything is titled. Does it have a beneficiary by law? Is there a right of survivorship with the joint owner? Did you name a pay on death beneficiary? Did you name another kind of beneficiary like a, a life insurance policy has a beneficiary or an IRA? Right. If you have no beneficiary, no joint owner with the right of survivorship, and it's not held in a trust with its own beneficiary, then it's going to go through your will if you have one or through the laws of intestacy if you don't have one. So, so you have you, to specifically say that it's joint owner with um, right. Yeah. So, so a deed, let's say again, you and I bought a house together. Mm-hmm. If we wanted it to be where if I died, my half would pass to you mm-hmm. or vice versa, then our deed would have to say Mary Hart and Martine Jackson as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. But if our deed instead said Mary Hart and Martine Jackson as tenants in common, my half would pass through my will. Your half would pass through your will. And if you didn't have one, it would go through the laws of intestacy. So it all depends on how things are titled. Look at your bank accounts. Is it just in your name? You know, if it's in the name of your LLC, well, who's the member of your LLC? Mm -hmm. If it's your revocable trust for estate planning purposes, your LLC will pass to your trust beneficiaries. If you are the owner of your LLC, then that asset is in your probate estate, which goes through your will or through the laws of intestacy. So you have to chase down how things are owned and and figure out how they pass by the law. And that's, you know, when I do the consulting, that's one of the main things we spend time on is because people don't understand that piece of it. They may have beautiful documents, 
But if they don't have beneficiaries named correctly or the assets aren't titled correctly, they may think they're passing one way at death and they don't do that at all. Right. So that's a huge mistake that people make is they don't understand how assets pass at death and draw a little flow chart to make sure that things are passing the way they think they're going to pass. Yeah, I definitely just learned something. I thought if it was a husband, like a husband and wife on it, and the wife died, it just went to the husband. That's what I nope. thought. Nope. <laughs> I didn't know you had yep. to be specific about it. Yep. So let's say that you were married and you didn't have any children, but your parents were still alive. Mm -hmm. In most states, and I've, I don't know every state's intestacy laws, but, but a common one is that your spouse gets a percentage and your parents get a percentage. So let's say you own the house you're standing in right now. Mm -hmm. You're married and you die. Now it's going to be owned probably part by your husband and part by your parents if they're alive. Do they get along? <laughs> Will they kick your husband out? Will they, or try to, you know. Will they force the sale? So let's say that happens. Let's just make up an example. And your mom's alive and you have a husband. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now the house ends up owned half by your mom and half by, this is my internet connection. It's unstable. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. You just froze a little bit. but that's Okay. Fine. So let's say that that house, you die, and now your house is owned half by your mom and half by your husband. Mm-hmm. Well, they don't like each other. They don't agree, whatever. I'm just making up an example. Right. Um, and they, they don't agree. And your husband wants to live there and your mom wants her money out and wants to sell it, but your husband can't afford to buy her out. Right. And so now they're at a deadlock. Well, either one of them can go to court and get a judge to force the sale of that house. Mm. Now, let's say your intention was that it went to your husband because it's your marital home. He lives in it. Right. It's where you live. All you have to do is write a simple will that says, I leave everything to my husband or I leave this house to my husband or whatever it is. It can be one sentence. Mm -hmm. But we have to I the last will just testament. rely on the law to do it. Right. <laughs> not unless you know exactly what the law is and you like what it says, which is 90% right. of the time, not the case. Right. <laughs> or they don't like it. Right. Right. right? Yeah. Wow. So those things are very important. Man, you brought up some really good points. Like, yeah, me thinking. I, some of that right. stuff, well, a lot of it, I didn't know. <laughs> but I haven't scared you yet. Let me keep going. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> should do this. This should be, you know, people make New Year's resolutions. This should be an end of the year resolution. People should be far down this path before New Year's Eve. Because we all know New Year's resolutions get broken. Make a resolution to have all this stuff finished by the time you hit New Year's Eve. Right, right. Because a will, yeah. for instance, doesn't have to be a fancy thing. Like, let's say you wanted to leave everything to your spouse or your partner or your best friend or your kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can pull out a sheet of paper, and all has to be in your handwriting, mm -hmm. right? Last will and testament at the top. We just did this with my stepdaughter because she was mm -hmm. traveling, and we, we, I dictated it to her. Just write this, you right. know, last will and testament. Write what you want. So you just write last will and testament. I, Martine Jackson, make this as my last will and testament. I hereby leave everything to whoever that would be. Right. I waive the bond requirement so my executor doesn't have to post a bond. I name so-and-so as my executor. Mm -hmm. So-and-so as my alternate executor. This is my will. You date it, you sign it all in your own handwriting. You now have a valid will. Takes it out of the laws of intestacy. Doesn't have to be fancy. A lot of people are going to rewind and stop and write they that down as you said it because yeah. that, yeah. I mean, that, that could at least work until you get to an yeah. attorney. Yep. Work until it gets to attorney. If you want to make sure that everything, you know, anything in your, this only covers anything in your separate name, remember, mm -hmm. but that could be LLC interests in your name. If you're the mm -hmm. owner of your LLC, your car, your house, your bank accounts, whatever it is, this will govern those assets titled in your own name and just mm -hmm. take out a piece of paper in your own handwriting. It has to be in your own handwriting, title it your last will and Testament. Mm -hmm. Say who you want to leave everything to who's an alternate beneficiary. If that mm -hmm. first person doesn't survive you, Right. Who's your executor? Who's the alternate executor? Date it and sign it. You have a valid last will and testament. Boom, the bomb. It's one page. It's a paragraph sometimes, it's not much. And and that will that's at least a stopgap measure. And you can do the same thing like if you need to name someone to act for you if you become disabled. You know, it's there are a lot of clauses you might want in here eventually, but if nothing else, say like a healthcare power of attorney. Title it at the top of a sheet of paper. Healthcare power of attorney. I, Martine Jackson, appoint so and so as my healthcare agent to mm -hmm. make all my healthcare decisions if I'm unable to do so myself. Date it, sign it. Right. You may need uh, witnesses for that, but it's it's and a notary, but it's better than nothing. At least somebody knows your intention. 
The last will and testament, you generally don't need witnesses or a notary if you do it in your own handwriting. Hmm. And then let's say someone left an asset or something that since it's in a will now it would go through probate. Does it do that? Or uh, yeah. Generally speaking, unless it's a very small estate and, and you're, you know, there's some exceptions, but generally it will go through either a small uh, probate action or full blown probate. If it's okay. something you die within your separate name. Okay, cool. Well, you gave some really good information. <laughs> I really appreciate you being on the podcast I know you gave us a lot of a lot of things to do <laughs> for people that don't have their paperwork in place. But is there any last like advice you want to give people? Maybe a starting point. I know you did mention yeah. um, write your will down in your handwriting if you don't have one. But um, is there anything else that you would recommend that? Just start. Do something. You know, write your ultimate love letter. Do something. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be perfect. I do think you should seek professional help eventually mm -hmm. uh, because this is not to get it right. is not a do it yourself type project. You can do the stop get measure, but it really needs someone who can look at all your situation, all your goals and your assets and everything and make sure that everything's talking to each other, right? That your trusts are meshing with your LLCs, right? And all that. Um, but just start, do something. Don't stick your head in the sand. It's like, it's like when people get the letters from the IRS and they don't want to deal with it. They don't even open the envelope. Right. People feel that way about an estate plan, right? They don't want to deal with it. Well, right. deal with it because it's truly the ultimate love letter to yourself and your loved ones. So just start. Okay. Well, thanks for being on, Mary. Sure. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I love your invitation for consulting is for everyone that's listening or not. Yeah, that's fine. You know, I don't, I don't do it all the time, but I just say people to reach out to me. You can either email me at maryhart at maryheartlaw.com, maryheart at maryheartlaw.com or, um, you know, yeah, that's probably, the, that's probably the easiest way. And just, I get a lot of mail email. So just write in there, you know, consulting request or something and we can talk and see if it's even the right fit you know it's, right. i don't do hourly consulting because i don't want to keep track of billing and i'm i'm, I'm not doing that okay. but if people really need my particular skill set they can come to the farm for two days we wine and dine them and have fun on the farm with frank my husband but in the meantime it's nice <laughs> the farm is awesome. we spend as much time as necessary sort of digging down into uh, their situation and making a plan that they can then take to their attorney to execute Okay. Well, thanks for being on. I'm about to wrap up the episode. Yeah, I really appreciate you. all the valuable content that you gave us today. I know I'm going to be listening and re-listening to this to catch all the things that I missed and making sure I check out the things that you um, told me to write down. So I really do awesome. appreciate your time today. You're quite welcome. Have a great day and goodbye to all the listeners. Enjoy all your day. Right. Until next time, Do It Movement right. listeners. See ya. See ya. Thanks guys for checking out the Do It Movement podcast this week. I hope we inspired you to make some power moves now. If you haven't already, make sure you follow us for more info on our guests and new episodes at Do It Movement Pod on Instagram and at doitmovementpod.com. Make sure as you apply some of this knowledge, you tag us along the way by adding hashtag do it movement so that we can recognize the change makers see you next week